era, I believe it was the Nixon era, like approach to foreign policy, which was like kind of narrowly tailored. Um, and Ron Paul goes before Congress and basically says like, we should we should only target Osama. Would do you support something along the, those lines? Like, would you have supported that as opposed yeah. So, to? Yeah, well, and I'm glad you brought that up. It's a really important point. So Ron Paul introduced what was called what's called a letter of mark and reprisal, which um, is in the Constitution, Article One, Section Eight, Clause Eleven. The Congress has the power to declare war or issue letters of mark and reprisal and make rules concerning laws concerning warfare and on the high seas and all this. Um, the the war power. It's in the same clause as the war power. Okay, mm -hmm. and what it is essentially is it's the power of Congress to declare war on groups less than states, groups of bandits, especially in traditionally pirates, right? And in other words, um, not just declare war on them, but also give them the right to pay bounties to any privateers who might capture or kill them. So mm -hmm. if you're a regular merchant ship and you bag a pirate or two, we'll pay you. And we're, we're essentially deputizing you and we're limiting your liability for any deaths of any pirates that you might commit, you know, any any killings of any pirates, because we're declaring that they no longer have the right to live. They're fair game. Go ahead and hunt them. Right. So by introducing this in Congress, what Ron Paul was doing was saying, don't attack the Taliban. Don't attack Muslims. Don't get carried away with this. And I quote in in the first book in Fool's Air in there. I love the way he puts it. It's just perfect the way he puts it, that we have to protect this country, and we, but we have to do so in a way that doesn't reinforce the narrative that bin Laden is trying to sell, that our mm -hmm. purpose is to attack and hurt and destroy and humiliate Muslims. That would help him even as we kill him. It would help his goals. So what we have to do is even though we're angry, we have to be smart. We have to, the answer to, and listen, because this is the whole purpose of terrorism, Liam, is to provoke a reaction. So if somebody's trying to provoke a reaction out of you, you owe it to yourself to instead be smart instead of emotional, to think things through and do the right thing instead of letting somebody jerk your chain, right? Mm -hmm. And that was what Ron Paul was saying. Everybody hold your horses. And now he did, I will say it was Barbara Lee he voted, who voted against the authorization to use military force. Ron Paul voted for it. And I asked him about it, um, in fact, probably too many times um, in different interviews over the years. And he's always said that, look, you know, this was the only one up for a vote. And it was somewhat narrowly ta tailored. I mean, the, the Cheney version was much broader. And mm -hmm. the Democrats succeeded in cutting out, you know, most of the worst language. And it really did say to target the guys that did the attack and anybody who harbored them. Does it's not doesn't say this is a blank check, like the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Yeah. They just interpreted it that way anyway, and said, "Oh, they just made up the term associated forces, which isn't even in there." And they just pretend that it is, and then now everybody's associated forces and whatever they want. Um, but you know, as I tell the story in the book, and I think as Ron Paul has explained too that he would have preferred diplomacy, right? He was just saying, you know, in the event that there's no peaceful way to solve this, then we should tailor the authority to attack the guilty as narrowly as possible to mm -hmm. avoid what obviously Bush and Cheney are trying to do, which is conflate the Taliban with Al Qaeda, with the government of Afghanistan with a guilty terrorist group so that they can do a regime change in Kabul and so that they can define the war on terrorism as broadly as possible and open to adding new states. Obviously, Iraq was their highest agenda to go along with it. And so that was, you know, if they'd done it Ron Paul's way, then it would have they would have avoided all of that regime change and the rest of that. Um, but I make the case in in both books, but in Fool's Errand with the details mm -hmm. that um, they deliberately let bin Laden escape. I think it, it's, you know, perfectly clear that they had the opportunity to negotiate his extradition and all of his men with the Taliban. The Taliban said, look, just give us some evidence and we'll turn them over to you. It doesn't have to be an ironclad conviction case, but give us some reason to believe that he did it, okay? In other words, we're trying to save face here. We want rid of this guy. We don't want to get carpet bombed. We want to give him over to you. 
give us a piece of paper with something on it, please. And Colin Powell said, we're working on a dossier right now. He went on Meet the Press and said that the Secretary of State, we're working on a dossier. As we just discussed, they knew there was an attack coming all summer long. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that there was any question that bin Laden and Zawahiri and their men were behind this thing, that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had made his alliance with bin Laden back in whatever it was, 1998 or whatever. Um, all this stuff. They knew all of this. And they yeah. could have done it. And the Taliban said, we'll give them to any Muslim country. Well, that could have been Jordan or Malaysia or Egypt or any absolute sock puppet dictate. Well, Malaysia is not a dictatorship, but um, any sock puppet dictatorship of America. I probably wouldn't turn him over to Saudi. He might disappear before you get your hands on him. But send him to Jordan. Send him to Kuwait. What are the Kuwaitis going to do? The Kuwaitis are going to let his plane land on the tarmac, and then they're going to give clearance for that plane to take right off again to head for North America. They wouldn't even extradite him, right? They drop the paperwork later. Americans, you can have him. Come on. This is a, a put on, right? It was a put on. The Americans were pretending, oh, the Taliban are being intransigent. Well, they're not being intransigent. They're saying, give us the slightest bit of face saving and we'll turn him over. The Americans said no. Bush said no negotiation. So they said, well, turn him over. We'll turn him over to the Pakistanis. Again, give us some proof and we'll turn him over to the Pakistanis who are working closely with you now. And of course, they'll turn him right over. Bush said, nope, absolutely not. No conditions, no negotiations. Forget about it. I mean, why should that be? No negotiations. Okay, I get it. We're really mad. Right. But you can get your hands on the guys. If you send Colin Powell, the former four-star general, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's your secretary of state, pretty tough guy, right, to go and handle this. Seems like he can handle this. His deputy, Dick Armitage, had told the Pakistanis, you're going to do everything we say or we're going to reduce your country to the Stone Age. You understand? And you know what they said? We understand, sir. And they were absolutely in America's pocket. Doing, look, the only reason they backed the Taliban is because America worked with Saudi to help them back the Taliban in the first place in the Bill Clinton years, right? There's no question that they were going to be cooperative, that they were already being cooperative with the Americans as of the evening of September 11th, mm -hmm. okay? No question about that. But nope, they ruined the deal. Then finally, at, on October the 8th, after the bombs started falling, admittedly, the Taliban said, okay, okay. We'll turn them over to any third country in the world, probably excluding Israel, although they didn't even say that. We'll turn them over to any third country in the world without any evidence if you just stop the bombing. And the Bush government said, nope, too little, too late. And then what they do? They took the entire war to the Taliban in the north of the country, to Kunduz and to Kabul, while bin Laden and his men were getting away. And they knew, and I show in the book, they knew that bin Laden and his men were at the lion's den, which they should have assumed from the very beginning, that of course they were at their lion's den hideout in Tora Bora in the Nangarhar province from the very beginning. That was where they were planning to make their stand. And that, but they're right by the Pakistani border there. And so they spent, you know, weeks. It was, they didn't really engage them until the second week of December, three weeks after they knew he was there. And then as I show in the book, it's in uh, Jawbreaker by Gary Bernson, the CIA officer who was on scene and uh, Kill Bin Laden by Dalton Fury, which is the alias of um, the commander of Delta Force on scene, Thomas Greer. They wanted and needed, desperately needed Green Berets and Army Rangers as reinforcements to back them up. And they were just refused over and over and over again for weeks. They were refused. There were plenty of Rangers right there at the Bagram Air Base, a helicopter right away. The Green Berets were screwing around fighting for the communist butcher war criminal general dostum up there in the north at mazari sharif where they had no business whatsoever again there and i remember the coverage at the time Ooh, mazari sharif we're fighting the taliban all this is going on and look there was a prison uprising and our heroic cia officer mike span was killed and all these things what the hell are they doing at mazari sharif bin laden is in nangahar province yeah what are they doing fighting for the communist butcher, war criminal, General Dostum against the Taliban when that's not who attacked us. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, it's straight out of, you know, you read it in Bob Woodward's book, Bush at War, which is taken straight from the NSC documents, from the minutes of the meetings of Bush's National Security Council Principals Committee in the days and weeks after the attack. 
that's all primary source quotations of these men, particularly Donald Rumsfeld and Paul Wolfowitz. Even Dick Cheney was like, guys, guys, we'll get to Iraq, but we got to do Afghanistan first. Come on, you know, but Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz are like, listen, Rumsfeld, especially, yeah, hey, hey, hey. We don't want to define this thing too narrowly. What if hypothetically, what if we got bin Laden? Would the American people think the war is over? We don't want the American people to think the war is over. Let's say it like this. Getting bin Laden is not success and failure to get bin Laden is not failure. And maybe we should start bombing Iraq right now so the American people don't get the idea that this is a limited excursion against the few guilty men who attacked us. We don't want them to be confused. We need to get other theaters of operation going now so that the story remains as broad as possible from the beginning. Meanwhile, bin Laden's getting away. Rumsfeld's the secretary of defense. And is he telling Tommy Franks, I want every man with a rifle you got at Tora Bora now to kill these men dead? No, he's refusing to allow the reinforcements to go. And then, and I got all their BS rationalizations after the fact. Well, we didn't want to stir up some Pakistani tribal men because that would have been bad. What would have been bad about that? Who gives a crap about that? You know, um, this is their excuse for not chasing them across the border into Pakistan, an allied country, right? This is like some criminals say the terrorists are in the United States and they're escaping from, you know, the 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 um, accessories to the September 11th attack are escaping from New York into Canada. And then the Americans go, oh, no, they made it to Canada. We can't even do anything. Yeah, right. We can't even call the Mounties and ask them to intercept the guys. Mm -hmm. We just, we're just, oh, we have to give up. Have to throw our hat and stomp on it and just pout because they got away. Like they jumped into hyperspace and there's nothing we can do to follow them. When it's just an imaginary line and a valley and a mountain and these are the Delta Force. You think they don't know how to hike a mountain and kill a man? That's their job. That's their only job. Mm -hmm. Dalton Fury talks about in the book, it's Thomas Greer. He also went on 60 Minutes and he explained, they came up with all these different plans for going after him. We're denied every single time. They're the Americans. They got Chinooks. They said, here's what we'll do. Now that they've escaped to Pakistan, we'll fly over the mountain and then we'll come over the mountain this way and meet them from the east. We'll get them then. Nope, denied. Wow. Okay, we'll fly, we'll fly helicopters in all the probable valleys. There's only three or four valleys they could possibly be traveling through, and we'll mine the hell out of them. And that'll slow them down, and we'll be able to track them. And Nope, denied. And, and Greer says, and I'm sorry I'm going on on this one point, but Greer says that in his experience as, I guess he was a lieutenant colonel, but he was the commander on the ground. He was like temporarily promoted to colonel while he's running the thing. And I'm pretty sure is the way it was. He said in his experience... And this is Delta, okay? These are the top tier, equal to SEAL Team 6. This is the very top tier special operations forces, okay? When they ask permission to, here's what we want to do on a tactical level to achieve their mission, he said in his experience, they are never denied. Never. This is the Delta Force. If they say, sir, we need X, they get X. They're not screwing around. They were out there on the most serious mission of all. And he said he'd been doing this for years and years and years. He'd never heard of a time where Delta said, we want permission to do this or that. And they were told no. They wouldn't be asking for permission if it wasn't necessary. Mm -hmm. And he just, as, as, as he puts it, and as CIA uh, commander Gary Bernson puts it, they both put it, we just couldn't understand why they wouldn't go along with our requests. Thousands of Rangers, thousands of Green Berets. You know, our, our recent um, very temporary Secretary of Defense, Christopher Miller, mm -hmm. under Trump after the election um, in, the, in the lame duck session there, he was a Green Beret fighting in the North in Afghanistan during that time. I saw a thing where he gave a speech. He talked about his captain, or his, um, sorry, his commander was Colonel Mulholland. Well, Colonel Mulholland is the guy who's repeatedly chastised and attacked in Thomas Greer's book, Kill Bin Laden, as the Green Beret commander who would not share his men. All we need is half of your guys, please. And the answer was no, 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 no. And it was because Donald Rumsfeld told me not to. 
And that, you know, Mulholland wasn't willing to say, fine, fucking throw me in jail. I'm going to help Greer kill bin Laden. Right? Instead, he refused. And Christopher Miller was one of his guys up there screwing around fighting the Taliban while bin Laden was getting away.